But what I'm here for is to talk about, from our church's perspective, a bit on uh, what is next or what's next. And that's a, an important question to ask. Because this journey for our particular church and for us began approximately 23 years ago or so. When as a church, we were the Blue Point Bible Church. Uh, excuse me, the Blue Point Baptist Church. This church held to a Baptist kind of doctrine, though it was independent, and it was, for the most part, a pre uh, dispensational church. Oh, so what changed? Well, pastor at the time was a pastor, Claire Chandler. And as he looked into the scriptures, he would see things that most pastors were afraid to approach, even to even discuss. He was bold enough and brave enough to share them with his congregation. I'm starting to see something a little different. I see things a little uh, uh, unusual compared to what most would. How does it line up with the rest of the church? And as we began to search these things together, this is where we came to. So he started out by teaching dispensationalism and exactly what it is and the systems and what it, what it represents. And as a congregation, we started to say to ourselves, wait a minute, it just doesn't seem to add up. There has to be more behind understanding the scriptures and what this particular traditional teaching is. Let us dig a little deeper. Well, with that, one of the elders at the time, a man by the name of Raymond Pellucci, great man, great man of God, mighty warrior. He was in World War II, fought in the Battle of the Bulge, had been injured in the Battle of the Bulge, mighty warrior for our nation and a mighty warrior for God as well. He knew of this man, John Bray, and brought John Bray here from Florida to teach us what Matthew 24 was about. The significance of Matthew 24 that related to the people that Jesus was speaking to at the time that he said it. How would they have understood it? How would they have perceived it? What relevance was it to them? Basically, if you, if you looked at a dispensational perspective, it didn't mean anything for them because, of course, it means everything to us. But it kind of gives us, it gave us pause. It opened up the scriptures a little bit more to us. And to see that this was really teaching about the Roman Jewish wars and what was leading to, ultimately, A.D. 70 and the destruction of the temple. Well, that's kind of where we stood at that particular point. Then after shortly John Bray spoke here, we invited Ed Stevens. He came from Pennsylvania. He spoke to us for one day. He kind of shed a little more light on what it really means to be a full preterist. He spoke about how the relevance of history and the relevance of the scriptures really made a beautiful mosaic that answers so many questions as to what was being spoken of in the scriptures. With that, our particular church then really began to search the scriptures to see that the New Testament prophecies spoke of the coming destruction of the temple and the end of the old covenant age. And the return of Jesus was in order to bring a completed salvation. Because with any other system, you're left hanging. You don't have answers. You're kind of left just with this hoping, clinging to, there's something there, but I can't say what it is. But with an understanding of how the return of Christ in AD 70 brought a completed salvation, that our God did not leave it incomplete, but made it totally absolutely complete that this very day should we pass away we are still with him and the reason that I'm kind of giving this overview a uh, brief little history of our church is to show you that we've come to now be the Blue Point Bible Church where rather than standing as a church community on creeds confessions anything in particular in that respect we stand on the Word of God and as a church, we have a longing. We dig. 
If you're fortunate enough to come to one of our studies, either on a Sunday morning, Wednesday evening, Thursday evening, Saturday morning, yeah, we are a Bible church. <laughs> you will see a congregation that is not afraid of questions, nor the answers. We don't tell people to shush up, don't ask. We say, that's an interesting proposal. Let us look a little deeper. So that we are a unique church in that respect, where we do allow the freedom to ask the questions, to answer the questions, or to say, we need to dig a little deeper. And that's how we grow in our Christianity. After all, Christianity, our belief in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, is what, it, what it's about in our walk with Him. And when we can have our faith in Him and still dig deep and confess that we are Christians, that is how we grow in our faith. I want to just take a quick look here at uh, Acts 16, 25 through 34. I'd like to read that to you. But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there came a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison house were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer awoke and saw that the prison doors opened, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself. Suddenly that prisoner, supposing that the prisoners had escaped, but Paul cried out with a loud voice saying, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And he called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And after he brought them out, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Very basic question. Very fundamental question. Note that the Jew, Jew, jailer asked, what must I do to be saved? It's because he saw a great miracle happen before his very eyes. He saw the jailhouse fall apart, but the prisoners were still there. He drew his sword in preparation to kill himself because he knew if the prisoners had escaped, that of course his superiors would have taken his life. But he saw something different. He saw in these people who were in his jail at that time, not escaping, not claiming that now we have freedom, we can do what we want, but rather they stayed there and showed a love and a compassion and what Christianity is about, which drew this jailer to ask that question. What must I do to be saved? And Paul and Silas did not answer with, you must have the right doctrines. Let us teach you first. You must believe and hold to the teachings of the apostles because even they, they differed, Paul from Peter and, and sometimes uh, John Mark. They had their contentions, Barnabas. That there was problems within that. Or even uh, uh, to, did they give a complicated explanation of the gospel? Rather, the answer was simple. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You and your household. Simple. Very, very elementary. Simple faith. Believe in Jesus. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Very simple. It's not a difficult, it's not complicated, but yet it is so profound. It is so deep in that it affects an individual's life at a particular moment and that lasts through eternity. We see uh, uh, Jesus said, uh, with God, with people, uh, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. And when that change takes effect, it is the proof that God is effective Another piece of uh, Pastor Chandler's wisdom that he would share would be, we are not saved by our doctrines. It is faith, and that not of ourselves. 
It is a gift from God by His grace that He allows us to see the Scriptures unfold, to open up. And He allows us to see the beautiful face of Jesus through His Word. I don't mean it to say that we have to wait until there's this physical being before us. We don't need that. Because by faith, we believe that Jesus had that physical faith. And we believe that he is with us. And we believe that he is there in his word as we read it, as we study it. Dear brothers and sisters who are in the Lord Jesus Christ, we stand equal before God. There is no doubt about it. None of us are greater than the other. We read in uh, Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. Thus says the Lord, Let not a wise man boast of his wisdom, and let not the mighty man boast of his might. Let not a rich man boast of his riches, but let him who boasts boast of this, that he understands and knows me, God, that I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For I delight in these things, declares the Lord. These words that Jeremiah had penned so long ago, approximately in the time of 586 B.C., after the house of Israel had been taken by the Assyrians and the Babylonians had brought into exile the house of Judah, they speak clearly and boldly to the church today as well. In the year of 2019, the year of our Lord, some 2,619 years or so after this was written, the church would rather boast in their wisdom, in their might, in their riches, and in their numbers, rather than in the loving kindness the justice and the righteousness of God here on earth. So what is next? The title of our conference, what's next? Perhaps what is next should be a step back, taking a look at ourselves. Perhaps what is next is we should remove ourselves for a moment from the, from the slings and arrows and the fighting and the conversations and the debates and all and allow Jesus to go before us. That we step back from our boasting and let the loving kindness, the justice, and the righteousness of our God go before us. As I was reading, or I, as I read, uh, John's Gospel, chapter 17, what's commonly known as the high priestly prayer, I wonder sometimes, is this an unanswered prayer? Jesus begins by stating, uh, stating the mission for which he was sent to earth. Verses 1 through 3. Jesus spoke these things and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. You, even as you gave, me, gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That's eternal life. Knowing our Lord and Savior, what he has done for us, that he has, by his grace and his mercy, brought us into his body. Brought us into him, that we partake of such a great glorious uh, presence. And what Jesus prayed for sounds a lot like what Jeremiah wrote 600 years or so before. Only now, Jesus' ministry and work, we have more intimate knowledge of who God is. For he has shown us who he is. John 1.18, no one has seen, the, seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. Or as... The NIV version would be, he has made him known. Basically, if you want to see God, you look 
at Jesus. Jesus said to Philip in John 14, 9, Have I been so long with you, and yet you do you not and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? For he, uh, for who, uh, he who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Let me recap the basics here for a second. We who have faith in Jesus Christ, because of his grace, because of his mercy, simply believing in Jesus, we have eternal life. For it seems so simple and so clear that even Moses in the wilderness with, his, his, with the Israelites leading them through that wilderness when they were bitten by snakes in Numbers uh, 21, when, the, uh, when they were bitten they would, pass, they would die. Then the Lord said to Moses because he was, you know, what can we do about this? Make a fiery serpent and set it on a standard and it shall come about that everyone who was bitten when he looks at it, when he looks at it, he will live. And Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a standard. And it came about that if a serpent bit any man, when he looked to the bronze serpent, he lived. Such a simple prescription that all they had to do was look upon this serpent. The scriptures seem pretty clear about that. In John 3, 14 and 15, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up so that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. Simple. You see Jesus on the cross. You know that he shed his blood and died for us. That he rose again. This is, the, this is the acts that he has done for us. And regarding all who believe in Jesus Christ, that is from the first century on, Jesus' prayer in John 17, verses 21 and 20. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but those who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. This is where Jesus' prayer sometimes seems unanswered, that they may be one. Because from the very beginning, man has entered into the church through that blood, through Jesus Christ. And once in that body of Christ, they seem to want to, to wanna, fight with one another and tear that body apart. And it's such a shame, that glorious, beautiful body that would died for us, that rose for us, that has given us a completed salvation. Just because someone may say a little different view or have a different way of worship, that it should tear that body apart. What a sin that is. The church never seems to be completely unified unless under threat of, uh, of death and, or because of politics or what have you, something outside of faith alone that has ripped the church apart. I ask you what scripture in the Bible can tell you where it requires to be under threat for the unity of the church for anyone who believes that, that it has to be that way. So I ask the church, is it a sin to think or to question. After all, we've been doing it for many years. So many would answer that question, unfortunately. Yes, it is a sin. And when it, when it went, excuse me, and then, and to them, the response is, if someone should think, or if someone should question something a little different than what they've heard, it is a, the, the ultimate thing Label them a heretic immediately, making them anathema to the church. Anathema means to, uh, means to, to something or someone that one vehemently dislikes. 
a formal curse or, by a pope or a council of the church to excommunicate a person or denouncing a doctrine immediately. Anathema, don't want any part of it. By faith, you've entered into the body of Christ, but how dare you question? How dare you look a little different at the scriptures than I do? If you do, want no part of you. It's got to hurt. It's got to hurt the body of Christ that he has put together. Jesus and the apostles had a similar situation in their day in Mark 9, 38 through 40. Jesus said to uh, uh, John said to him, that is to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to prevent him from uh, because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not hinder him, for there is no one who will perform a miracle in my name and be able to soon afterward to speak evil of me. For he who is not against us is for us. If Jesus could accept someone casting out demons in his name, though that person did not follow the twelve, why is it that people today who supposedly are Christians are part of that body, the church, a people whom Jesus prayed for to be one can't accept each other with different understandings, a little different view, a different perspective. Almost all of us today who hold to a fulfilled eschatology have come from, uh, uh, most, most likely have come from leaving that futurist perspective. When you come into the church, most teachings are very plain right there. Jesus should return sometime soon. Don't question it. Don't, don't say you know, anything about it. Just hold to that fact. We saw back in, what was it, 2012, where uh, one of the radio personalities was saying Jesus was going to return on that particular day, and people gave up all their possessions for that cause, and nothing came of that, except for probably a lot of disillusionment when, they, when it wasn't fulfilled. Um, does that mean, when you question these things, and you change as a Christian, as you mature, does that mean you are less of a Christian then, or more of a Christian then, and not a Christian today? So many people are unfortunately out there saying, mm, you can't be a Christian because you don't hold to what I hold to. And if you should change, there's something wrong with you because you're growing and asking questions and are open-minded. We can't have that. And I think it's because they fear searching out the questions and answers them very selves. We follow teachings that are given to us and, we, and we, we are just happy to be able to accept them and say this is the way it is. When you first hear about those futuristic perspectives, how one day you would look forward to Jesus returning in the clouds and that he would bring down the heavens here or bring us up to heaven and that would be a wonderful thing. If that's your perspective, does that mean that the blood of Christ did not cover your sins? Or if you say, Jesus Christ is here today. He has come. He has given us a completed salvation. We enter into his kingdom upon that faith, upon that confession. And in that kingdom, I have eternal life, never having to fear death. Is that a sin to look at it that way? It's, it's such a shame that there's so much infighting with these things. These questions um, that are being proposed in so many different avenues need to be looked at. But with that spirit that Jeremiah spoke of, of that loving kindness, the justice and the righteousness that should be in amongst all who believe. There are many ch churches today that are filled, filled with men and women who just simply sit there and say, well, my pastor teaches it. Never having studied or looked into the scriptures deep enough on their own journey with Christ, but simply, my pastor teaches it. And they are satisfied with that. And it, and it, and it, 
it's kind of a sad situation because when you have been brought into the body of Christ and he is willing to share himself with you, we ought to be willing to look and see him and search him and behold him to love him. Hebrews 4.12 tells us the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. God's word did not die with the church fathers, nor was it sealed up. The church fathers at that particular point did a good job with what they had. But we have grown so much since that time. Thousands of years later, we have, well, after all, we have Google. We have the King James Bible. We we have all this. We have so much more understanding through archaeology, uh, anthropology, theology, through history. We have so much more today than what they did a thousand or fifteen hundred or two thousand years ago. And that's that's a great thing because it allows someone like me, who is not overly intelligent. Some would say not intelligent at all, but, but but I can look at a Greek word or I can look at a Hebrew word and I can understand what it meant to those people back then rather than relying on somebody else who's going to tell me something different. One of the uh, things is when, we, when we're studying through the scriptures and particularly uh, Matthew uh, 24, 34, the word generation. You will find that almost every Bible that you see will have that word footnoted as race. That word is Ganea, not Ganeus. That word Ganea is the same word that's used in Matthew 24, yet that's not footnoted because that generation would make sense to a, a futuristic perspective that it was Jesus' generation. Now this other generation is some time forward. But it's the same word. It's a generation. It's, it's audience relevance. The, the Dead Sea Scrolls is an excellent uh, uh, verification of what the old scriptures said so long ago. That we are rich in ability to understand, to grow, and to study. Those who went through the Reformation deserve a lot of credit. How would they dare to go against an orthodox church? After all, anything they came up with would have been unorthodox. How dare someone question transubstantiation, indulgences, pedo-baptism? Yet today, I would think that most of us in this room would disagree with those orthodox teachings at the time. Because the church has grown. We have been given grace to search the scriptures. Men, women, and children were put to death for questioning these things. They saw this just simply because they saw the scriptures a little differently. Put aside the confessions. Faith in Jesus Christ. That's what, it, what brings eternal life. It is his life that came in the flesh, his death upon the cross, and the resurrection from the tomb that brings eternal life. As a preterist today, I look at my futurist brothers and sisters just wishing and longing that they could see the kingdom as I do, that we are in it, that we have that possession today that we don't need the physical, tangible elements to show us what it's all about. We have the Word of God. And He tells us that He completed everything. We have faith that this is true. And in that, it tells us the kingdom has come. We ought to be living as though we were in that kingdom. No longer do I wish or hope or long for these things. As I heard this great message once a couple of years ago, from hoping to having. And I have it. And I see it. 
and I touch it, and I feel it. But my brothers and sisters who are waiting, they don't see it. They don't have it. And it hurts that they don't. Because it's such a much, it's, it's a much more glorious position to be in. Before we were all born again, before, uh, or before I was born again, or, or, or from above, uh, and God quickened my spirit, I'd open up the Bible and it didn't mean much. Yeah, it was good stories, nice things to hear, but it didn't mean much. I was raised in the Roman Catholic Church. I went to uh, their schools for three years. I was even given the priesthood some serious thought. God's word, word meant little to me. There was no real understanding. And if you were to ask me about it, I'd say, yeah, it's a good book. I, you know, you know, I read a couple of passages out of it. Yet one night when I was working, someone shared the gospel with me through a very simple method of evangelism explosion. And from that time on, I had a hunger to know who Jesus is, what he has done for me. I had always thought I had to do something for him in order to get into his kingdom. But with that understanding, he has done it all that we can enter into that kingdom. And with that, I longed for and hungered for a deeper and richer understanding of the scriptures. It was the Spirit of God who gave me that, uh, that hunger. Paul writes of, of, this, of this experience in 1 Corinthians 2, um, verses 12 and 16, uh, through 16. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak, not in the words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words, except the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him and... Uh, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. But he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. It was basically as the song says, I was blind, but now I see. That spiritual realm, that spirit that enlightens and reveals the God's word to us is real. Now, I can't put it up on a screen. I can't put it before you. But trust me, it's real. And anyone who has been born from above, who believes in Jesus Christ, who has received eternal life, can testify that that spiritual understanding, that spiritual realm is real. Jesus tells the Samaritan woman, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So why am I a heretic? For I see that spiritual kingdom already established, entered into, that that spiritual work of salvation has been completed by my Lord and Savior. That Jesus returned exactly as he said he would before that generation passed away. Even though no one saw him in a physical form, that temple coming down was the proof by faith that he is God that he has brought with him the total, completed salvation that we longed for. I'm talking not in words taught by human wisdom because they would be foolishness, crazy, insane to them. But I am using words taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. So what's next? How about fulfilling Jesus' high priestly prayer? that they all may be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may 
be in us. For the past 20 years, our church has studied the scriptures. Yes, we have grown, we've stepped back, we look forward, we go in, but we grow in our understanding and our approach to God's word. That journey started so long ago with dispensationalism and understanding that to what it, was, what it says, to today being a full, full preterist church. Oh, that was a time when we almost lost this beautiful church. There was a time where we almost lost this church. And we would have lost the openness and the willingness to search the scriptures without fear of being labeled a heretic. Yet by God's grace today, we have a pastor, Pastor Michael Miano, who is willing to search the scriptures with his congregation into the deeper things of God. Very much like Pastor Chandler had started it out with. A congregation that won't fire, he doesn't have to fear being fired or thrown out because he questions something. There is a beautiful thing in that where the leader who is truly open to the scriptures sees something a little different and can bring it before his congregation and not have to worry about being fired. At least not till the conference is over. <laughs> For we know that Pastor Mike loves God. And it, that, that's unquestionable. It is true. His desire is to serve God. And that is true. He displays the fruits of the Spirit. He is a new creation in Jesus Christ. And we are grateful for that. Just like the rest of us are. So if a brother and a sister or a sister in the Lord sees the Scriptures... In a, in a more physical way. Jesus in a human body, even today. With the same body that he, he, his, he had during his ministry. And that he will ride in the clouds and come down from heaven. On that day, the people will be lifted up off the earth. And they will be, be held in clouds. And all of the things that are involved with, with um, the dispensational teaching. If they love the Lord as we do, how can we question their salvation? Or if a brother and sister in the Lord teach that it's a corporate resurrection rather than an individual body resurrection, yet they have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus, how can we question their salvation? Or if a brother or sister in the Lord sings and maybe even dances a little in the aisle to show the joy that the Spirit gives them, for what Jesus Christ has done for them, how can we say they are heretical? And how can we say they are not in the body? Face it, we have different views. But by God's grace, we have the freedom in Jesus Christ to think. We've might, we all might have heard this. I know I've heard this many times. God gave us brains. We should use them. <laughs> Thinking is not a sin. We have a freedom. There is nothing more sad than a congregation that just simply says yes to everything. In their Sunday school class, in their Bible studies, or even during their sermons, they just sit there and say yes, yes, yes. And afterwards you say, what did you just say yes to? Well, I don't know, but my pastor said it. It's a sad situation for the church. So what's next? How about settling our differences and setting them aside for the sake of Jesus Christ and his kingdom? How about if we die to ourselves that he might live? Show a unified faith, that of which Jeremiah even spoke of. I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth, for I delight in these things. The biggest difference between Christians and God seems to be that God doesn't want to be us. But there's all too many of us who want to be God and be able to say, oh, this one's saved, that one's not. This one's saved, oh, you have a different view? You must not be a Christian. How often, as full predators, have we heard, you are not a Christian? When Jesus Christ has done this to us, he has called us, he has given us new life, he has revealed himself. We have committed our lives to him. And yet, 
someone else will say, oh, you're not a Christian. It, it, it is a sad statement for the church. So, basically, the, the, my view of the scriptures is only that let's, let's have a true understanding with one another. That we don't have to be log, at loggerheads with each other. We can be, as brothers and sisters, able to share what we think. And if it does sound kind of ridiculous, well, let's take a deeper look and look at these things. That is what disciples are called to be, good students. I was an infant in the Word, but through reading, understanding, teaching, growing, I have gotten to the part where I can chew on a little meat now, I can look at the things a little different. It all began within the beginning the Word was. But now it's grown to quite, a, quite an understanding of God's grace and what he has done. We continually grow, not in a spirit of timidity, but we should be in a spirit of boldness, unafraid to ask the difficult questions and unafraid of what the answers might be. We ought to be like the Bereans searching the scriptures. We have been blessed in our particular congregation recently by someone who has been coming who has some different views. This individual is well-read, understands the scriptures, loves the Lord, but has some different views. He comes to our Bible study and talks about these things. We don't, I don't, we don't stop him. You can say it. And at times, honestly, he gives us pause to think. He has us questioning sometimes. He has us looking at different things, whether it's right or it's wrong. But, we have a beautiful openness that we can share those things. We don't cast somebody aside just because they have a different view. So that is what I must say is the beautiful thing about our church. I mean, I can see why pastors don't want questions, don't want any uh, 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 changes, because it jeopardizes their position. It's a, it's a human nature. But yet, we have that beautiful thing. Here in Blue Point Bible Church, we are not afraid to be a thinking faith. Wouldn't it be great if all churches could be that way? Open to think, open to question, open to search, and yet still have, show the loving kindness of our Lord and Savior. May he receive all the glory. Amen.